Why do living things die? Someday I'll be dead, and so will you. It's a fact of nature that all living things eventually die. This doesn't seem like the best outcome. So if evolution is so powerful at making organisms better, why aren't we immortal? It's not physically impossible. We can create young cells, fertilized eggs for example, and grow high quality healthy tissues and organs. We do that easily throughout our childhood during the process of development. But then those tissues, muscles, etc. wear out and we die. Even though biologically we should be able to regrow and regenerate healthy tissue to replace the old, we don't. So humans and every other living thing don't do something that should be possible and would be good for the organism involved. Is this a failure of evolution? Before we answer this question, it's helpful to distinguish between aging and senescence. Aging is a property of physics. Everything, mountains, stars, animals, plants, etc., ages over time and gets older. Time only moves one way. Senescence is a property of biology. Living things senesce over time, their quality degrading and deteriorating as their age increases. For example, the figure shows the fastest marathon times ever recorded divided into various age groups. From late teens to the early 30s, the times improve, but after that the world's best times get longer and longer. Even with the best professional training and motivation, marathon times get worse as people get older because they senesce, they experience senescence. Just to be super clear, aging is not the same as senescence. These are two different processes. Aging is unavoidable, but senescence doesn't violate the laws of physics, so why does it happen? There have been many hypotheses for why things senesce, but we'll look at the two that are the most commonly discussed. The first hypothesis I'll call the metabolic constraints hypothesis, and I'm grouping together two related hypotheses into this, the rate of living and the free radical hypotheses. Rate of living is the commonly used name, with free radical damage as the most commonly invoked mechanism. The general idea behind this hypothesis is that over a lifetime, metabolic chemistry causes cumulative and irreversible damage to cells, tissues, and organs. This damage can't be fully repaired, so the process leads to deterioration of the organism. A similar idea stems from the observation that when cells divide, their telomeres, important structures on the ends of each chromosome, get shorter with each round of mitosis and that this causes problems. Telomere shortening also fits in this general category in that an irreversible process causes problems to the cells. The second hypothesis I'll call the evolutionary hypothesis, or the antagonistic pleiotropy hypothesis. According to this, over evolutionary time, the natural selection of alleles with contrasting effects at different ages leads to senescence. The contrasting effects come from alleles that provide benefits in youth, but also cause deterioration in old age. First, let's look at the metabolic constraints hypothesis. According to the metabolic constraints hypothesis, cells are damaged irreversibly by the chemistry of living as the organism ages. We can use this hypothesis to make two predictions about what we should therefore see when we look at nature. First, since similar organisms use basically the same chemistry, the lifetime expenditure of energy, as measured by kilocalories per gram, for similar species should be almost identical. This is because they've maxed out the possible energy that can be used before suffering too much damage, and that metabolic limit should be pretty much the same for species with similar physiologies. Second, these metabolic constraints were subject to millions of years of natural selection, so that selection will have reduced senescence to the minimum possible given the unavoidable constraints and limits imposed by the chemistry required for life. So what do we see in nature? The first prediction was that lifetime energy expenditures should be similar for closely related organisms. To the right is data from a 2005 paper by Speakman. As always, links to this paper and any others mentioned are in the video description. In Speakman's study, he compared estimates of the lifetime energy expenditure values for a large number of different mammal and bird species. The x-axis uses a natural log scale, but I've indicated the width of a 50-fold difference. We can see that there is lots of variation within each of these classes of animals, not what the metabolic constraints hypothesis predicts. Not shown here, but as an interesting observation, marsupials have lower metabolic rates than placental mammals, but they also have shorter lifespans. This is the exact opposite of the pattern predicted by the metabolic constraints hypothesis. There is no evidence of a metabolic wall or limit from this kind of data. The second prediction of the metabolic constraints hypothesis is that since natural selection has reduced senescence to the minimum possible, additional selection should be ineffective. If there were alleles in a population that extended lifespan, they should have been selected and fixed in the past. There wouldn't be any more genetic variation remaining for that trait, and since natural selection requires variation to work, 
more selection wouldn't work. However, various selection experiments contradict this. The best known example comes from a 1984 study by Luckenbill et al. in which they selected for female fertility later in life and doubled the lifespan of Drosophila in just six months. Before the experiment started, the flies lived an average of about 30 days, but after 13 generations of selecting the females who laid their eggs later, they raised the average lifespan to about 60 days. Not only had past selection not fixed all the alleles that prolonged lifespan, there was enough genetic variation in the population to double the lifespan easily when that kind of selection was imposed. This easy increase in lifespan is strong evidence against some kind of hard metabolic limit that forces a maximum lifespan onto organisms. So neither of the predictions made by the metabolic constraints hypothesis were supported. This is good evidence against this process alone being the reason why living things die. Now for the second hypothesis. So what is the evolutionary hypothesis? For this hypothesis, we follow a thought experiment credited to Peter Medawar, the famous Lebanese-British scientist who won the 1960 Nobel Prize for Medicine. For this thought experiment, we'll consider a population of individuals. Medawar used the metaphor of a population of test tubes in a lab, but the exact type of individual doesn't matter as long as they fulfill some conditions. The individuals in our population are immortal, except for accidents, of course. They are biologically immortal, but not magically indestructible or invisible to predators. The individuals in our population will age, as everything must, but they do not senesce. Whatever their age, their risk of having an accident and dying is the same. The individuals in our population will reproduce randomly to fill spaces opened up by the deaths caused by accidents. The ability to reproduce for each individual is the same, no matter their age, because they don't senesce. The key point is that the starting point for the population is biological immortality and no senescence. Even if things are immortal, there will be fewer individuals of old age in the population because the random deaths make it harder to live too long. The plot shows the proportion of individuals in a group that are still alive over time if they each have a 2% chance of dying in each time period. By the time we get to an age of 200, less than 2% of the original individuals would still be alive, even though they are biologically immortal and don't senesce. The interesting part comes when we think about genetic differences between the individuals in our population. We can ask ourselves, what is the effect of an allele that kills or reduces reproduction at an old age? Since most individuals are dead by then, it probably won't have much of an effect on the fitness for a typical individual. Selection would be pretty weak against this allele if it appeared as a mutation. What is the effect of an allele that improves survival or reproduction at an early age? In this case, since most individuals are still alive, this may have more of an impact on the fitness for a typical individual. Selection would probably increase the frequency of an allele like this. But most interestingly, what is the effect of an allele that does both? In this case, most individuals would experience the benefit, but only a few would experience the detriment. The net overall effect on the fitness of a typical individual would probably be positive. Selection would therefore tend to increase the frequency of an allele like this. The population would evolve to possess this allele which causes senescence. This is an abstract argument, so let's look at some concrete examples. Here's the baseline scenario for some numerical examples. These aren't meant to perfectly represent any specific species, but the general results can give us some insight. We'll look at several examples using the same plots and calculations. The top figure shows the proportion of original individuals which are still alive at each age up to 200 age units. Let's call them years. By age 200, the number of original individuals remaining is extremely small, so we'll ignore ages past 200 to keep things simple. The center figure shows the survival rate for each age over the 200 years. For our baseline, the survival rate is 98%, a 2% mortality rate, which is why the values are all in a line at 0.98 on the figure. The constant survival value is what causes the exponential decrease in the proportion surviving in the top figure. The bottom figure is the per individual rate of reproduction at each age. I've chosen a value of 0.02035, which will result in a stable population. At each time period, 2% of the population dies, but with this rate of reproduction, the remaining 98% have enough babies to exactly replace them. A population with these values would be stable. The fitness of this genotype is 1.000. If a mutation occurs that creates new individuals with different survival or reproduction values, then it would compete with the original genotype within the population. Any mutation with a higher fitness would be favored, any with a lower fitness would be selected against. Let's look at some examples using this baseline as our starting point. 
For our first numerical example, let's look at a case where the yearly survival rate is 98% like the baseline, up to age 70, but drops to 90% after that. The center figure shows the change from 0.98 to 0.90, and the top shows the effect of that on the proportion of original individuals surviving. We'll keep the same reproductive rate for this example. Let's modify the figures slightly to show the baseline values in light blue so we can compare them more easily. If we calculate the fitness of individuals with an allele like this, their fitness would be 0.8156. This is much lower than one, and a mutation like this would be selected against and be very unlikely to fix and become the new genotype in the future. For our second numerical example, let's look at a case where the yearly survival rate stays 98% like the baseline for all ages, but where the reproductive rate is 0.02035 like the baseline until age 70, at which point it drops to 0.01. The bottom figure shows the change from 0.02035 to 0.01, and the other two figures stay the same since we haven't changed the survival probability. If we calculate the fitness of individuals with an allele like this, their fitness would be 0.883, also lower than 1 and likely to be selected against. For our third numerical example, we'll slightly increase the survival probability to 99% up to age 70, and then dramatically decrease it to 90% after that the reproductive rate stays the same. The middle figure shows the minor increase in early survival rate and larger decrease in the late survival rate, and the top figure shows the effect. The fitness of individuals with an allele like this would be 1.1195, 12% better than the baseline. This higher fitness is even though we can see from the top figure that now almost everyone dies by age 100, whereas in the past more than 10% of the individuals made it to 100. An allele that improves the health of young individuals a little, at the expense of a major reduction in the health of older individuals, is beneficial overall. For our fourth numerical example, we'll keep the survival probability at 98% for all ages, but change the reproductive rate. The bottom figure shows an increase in early reproductive rate from 0.02035 to 0.24, and a decrease of exactly three times that magnitude in the late reproductive rate, from 0.02035 down to 0.0094. The fitness of individuals with an allele like this would be 1.0144, a bit better than the baseline, even though we lowered the late reproductive rate by three times as much as we increased the early rate. For the last numerical example, we'll combine the changes to the survival and reproduction from the previous two examples together. Now the fitness of individuals with the mutant allele would be 1.255, over 25% higher. This is more than we may have expected from the separate 12% and 1.4% increases. The effects of favoring youth in both survival and reproduction at the expense of these traits in the older individuals combine synergistically, giving us an outcome higher than the sum of the individual effects. It's clear from these examples that alleles that provide benefit in youth but detriments later can easily be advantageous overall. And if they're advantageous, the natural selection will favor them. This is all well and good, but do these kinds of genetic effects exist? And if so, how do we think about them? The term pleiotropy is used when a gene has multiple functions. The term antagonistic pleiotropy describes when a gene has multiple functions that oppose each other in terms of their fitness effects. The examples we looked at, with opposite survival or reproduction effects depending on the age of the individual, were antagonistically pleiotropic. A mutation that improves reproduction at the expense of survival could also be antagonistically pleiotropic. Since selection is weaker on older individuals, antagonistically pleiotropic alleles that are advantageous in the young and deleterious in the old, especially after most reproduction has occurred, are advantageous overall. In fact, if we look back at that figure of the marathon times, we can see that the physical fitness of humans drops off in the late 30s, after most people are done reproducing. That's not a coincidence. Evolution will therefore fix a series of these genes as they arise by mutation. It's an unavoidable consequence of mutations and the fact that nothing is indestructible. It turns out that if antagonistic pleiotropy exists, senescence is inevitable because of evolution. This begs the question, does antagonistic pleiotropy exist, or is it just something in a thought experiment? Is there any empirical evidence for the existence of antagonistically pleiotropic genes? One example is Huntington's disease, a dominant genetic disorder caused by alleles of the Huntington HTT gene with many cytosine, adenine, guanine trinucleotide repeats. 
The bad effect of having these longer alleles is developing Huntington's disease, which destroys neurons in the neostriatum, a brain region responsible for motor control and cognition. Severe physical and mental effects manifest from around age 40 until death at around age 60. Note that the negative effects don't begin until reproduction is mostly done. There appears to be a positive effect of these longer alleles, however. For individuals with these longer alleles, there's evidence for reduced cancer risk and an increased number of offspring during the period of time before the disease's negative effects. Another example is cystic fibrosis, a recessive genetic disorder caused by a deletion within the CFTR gene, which compromises a cellular transmembrane chloride channel. Individuals with these alleles suffer from system-wide fluid buildup, especially in the lungs, which leads to fatal bacterial infection. On the other hand, heterozygotes who have only one copy of the allele show increased reproduction, this comes from epidemiological studies on humans, and resistance to cholera toxin, this comes from studies in mice that likely mean the same for humans. These are just two examples. There are many more examples, including a number that are described in a paper I published with a former student in 2011. A direct link to this paper is in the video description. It's interesting to think about what it means to be the real cause of senescence. For this, we need to think about two types of causes. A proximate cause is a causal event closest to the result whereas an ultimate cause is an event responsible for one or more of the proximate causes. The proximate causes may be important, but they only exist because of the ultimate cause. Free radical damage and telomere shortening may indeed be proximate causes for senescence in many organisms, but they are not the ultimate cause. Evolution, via the selection of antagonistically pleiotropic alleles, which themselves may increase free radical damage or telomere shortening, is the ultimate cause responsible for senescence and death. But what does identifying antagonistic pleiotropy as a core aspect of the ultimate cause provide for us? Is this useful in some way? Are there useful implications that come from learning that antagonistic pleiotropy is part of the ultimate cause for death? There is one ultimate cause, but many known and unknown proximate causes that arise from it. We know some of them, but we may not know the others. Fixing one proximate cause won't fix all the others. There could be tons that we don't know about. For example, we only discovered Alzheimer's in the early 1900s because prior to that, very few people lived long enough for this disease to be recognized. And now Alzheimer's is responsible for 60 to 70% of dementia cases and about 30 million people worldwide have it. Even if we cure Alzheimer's, there are likely other problems we haven't discovered yet that would come later. Therefore, unfortunately, a major implication of antagonistic pyotropy as a part of the ultimate cause for death is that there won't ever be a single magic bullet treatment to fix senescence and end death. Curing the specific disorders that kill the elderly is likely to resemble a long-term game of medical whack-a-mole. Also, even if we do find treatments for various health issues tied to antagonistically pyotropic effects, fixing each proximate cause, especially with genetic engineering in youth, may cause other problems we don't anticipate. I hope you found this video about why we die interesting. We can't live forever, but we can make the best of what time we do have by watching good YouTube videos. Share this video and like or subscribe if you enjoyed this video. Links to others can be found on the Evolution Examples website.